I had made, you know, two films in particular, back to back, one of which was two continents and three countries and it involved uh, the Amazon jungle and it was a very difficult movie physically. Uh, I mean, I loved doing it. I'm very happy that I did it, but it was, you know, you have scorpions on your legs and it's 100 degrees. I mean, at a certain point, the, the environment doesn't want you there. And then I made another film which was technically really difficult and difficult for other reasons. And I said, I, I have to rediscover what it is I love about the medium because it's not the logistics. It's to try and convey some, dare I use the word, soul. And uh, I remember talking about this at length with my wife one night, you know, and she said, well, why don't you do something that is as personal as you can? I said, that's, such, that's exactly what I have to do is just get rid of all the noise. I never have lacked for a, a desire to keep making films, to keep working. I love the medium. I think it's the great art form of the last century. But it did allow me to rediscover what's important about the medium, and that matters. When we started shooting, I remember the camera operator, who's a lovely, lovely, and brilliantly talented guy, had admitted he had never seen 400 blows. And I remember Darius Kanji, the cinematographer, he said, no, you have to see that. I said, no, 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 don't let him see it, because I didn't want to rip off those movies. What I did try to get from them is how personal they are and how much soul that Fellini and Truffaut were able to bring to them, and how there was no distance between the people in it and them. It wasn't done with irony. In, in the case of Amarcord, uh, I loved how the reminiscence was not purely sentimental, that the existence of Il Duce so, was, uh, sort of hung over the whole film and that the war was coming and that you got the sense that the destruction of Italy was just a little bit on the horizon and it lent a kind of melancholy to the entire experience. I found that very powerful, and I wanted to steal that from it. I wanted to steal a kind of political idea, an idea of history, and basically saying history has its way with us sometimes. And that's what I got from that. And if 400 Blows was just because the, 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 the empathy that the film shows toward that boy, the closeness that we have to him, and I wanted to try and get close to the child and the children in my film. So that, that was really the, the reasons for those two references. I was in a, a gallery in Los Angeles, an art exhibit, and on the wall it had been written, uh, history and myth begin in the microcosm of the personal, which I found deeply moving. And what I tried to do was to, in some ways, almost intentionally make the story as small as I could so that it could have a kind of more a greater universality to get the details right. When we look at things and how they occur in life, sometimes it's very small actions or moments of fate that you don't quite expect. Somebody arrives two minutes late or that change everything. And when I thought back about these episodes in my own life, my desire was to render them with as much detail and I hate to use the word accuracy, but as much detail and as accurate as I could be to my own recollection, of course, is, you know, there's no such thing as the truth, but there is my truth. So I was trying to do that with as much detail as I could, and hopefully there a universality might sprout. You, you work very differently with children, frankly, than you do with adults, and particularly adults of such tremendous uh, stature as artists. With COVID, it became a very strange process. You know, you go to the set and you're dressed in like a hazmat suit and it's like, this is a very intimate scene, you know, and you're like that. But what you do discover with children is you almost work with them the way I imagine that like uh, William Wyler or Alfred Hitchcock could have worked with their actors in what we used to call, uh, maybe we still do, a sort of filmic representational style of acting where, you, you know, Hitchcock could say to Cary Grant, you move from there to there and you say your line or whatever and Cary Grant walks five steps just like he asked him to and says, I don't understand what you're doing or whatever and that's how he could storyboard the movie. Now we know that with Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando and that whole, uh, the, the ocean of brilliant actors that came to us in the late 40s, early 1950s with Stella Adler and Lee Strasberg and Sanford Meisner and all this technique, 
that the style of acting really transformed. And once Brando picked up that glove for Eva Marie Saint and on the waterfront, the whole paradigm shifted and our style of directing had to change. You could no longer say, this is the shot and tell the actor, move but with children, you can. With children, you say, move from here and you say the line here like this, and they actually do it. So in some senses, it's easier. Now, why is it harder? It's harder because if you tell them to do that, sometimes it's terribly inorganic. So when I cast the movie, I must have read 600 kids um, over Zoom, and then uh, many of whom were brilliantly talented. And, and uh, I think I narrowed it down in each role to about six or five kids, uh, all of whom I loved, of course. And then it becomes about an intangible quality that you're looking for to fit the particular work. And I just remember in the case of these two kids, how much they listened. I would throw the improvisation stuff at them during the you know, Zoom auditions, and they really responded. And you realize that acting is, is an intelligence. It's a sensitivity. It's an ability to listen. And the two boys had it, you know. And I, I'm still quite close with both of them, and we text all the time and that sort of thing. My father was still alive when we shot it. He died during the editing process of COVID, actually. And that was, very, uh, that was very hard for me because I wanted him to see the film. It's weird. I, I didn't show them that much or tell them that much about my own parents. I felt that they could use what was in the script because I didn't want an impersonation. I didn't want you know, them to mimic. But it strangely happened anyway that they played my parents with incredible accuracy. I find it very gutsy, by the way, what uh, Annie Hathaway does, because it's not an entirely sympathetic portrait. Uh, accurate, but not sympathetic. And um, was willing to, you know, show herself on screen with the bags and the whole thing, and to wear, you know, Sears and roll book catalog clothing and, and so forth, which is all to my memory. But it's not typical movie star glam, you know. She's not asking for the filter and the backlight and all that. And, you know, that's... It is pretty gutsy to do that, and I was just deeply grateful to both of them. Because what I said to them is I said, no distance from the character, don't look down to the about the character, and, and no irony, and just try to steal the part of yourself that you're least comfortable with uh, and use that for the movie. The English is a difficult language because the word melodrama is uh, not synonymous with melodramatic. They mean very different things. A, a melodrama can be beautiful. I mean, anyone who watches, uh, I don't know, some Douglas Sirk movie from the 50s or something, they, they are told with such sincerity and they transcend. Melodramatic means that the emotions are pitched in a way that they feel fake and over the top. And what I was trying to do was to make it unfold uh, like my memory, which was small things and small dramatic moments actually add up to catastrophe sometimes. I saw this period, and I, to me it was a tremendous challenge to try and do it because I, I was trying to be honest in the revelation of these events and not hype them and not make them like, you know, like I'm the most important person on planet Earth and that self-aggrandizement or anything. I was trying to say, you know, I'm guilty, you're, we're all sort of complicit in the way that the world works. The idea was always to make something that sort of simmered in a very uncomfortable way uh, and, and maybe only exploded later on in your mind if I were lucky enough to have that happen. I mean, I love him dearly. He's like a brother to me. Uh, it's my third movie with him. Our second movie was so physically difficult that I remember us arguing, you know, a lot in the middle of the Amazon, you know, knee deep in the this river and came and swimming around. I'd be like, no, I have to wait for the sun to go behind the cloud. I said, Darius, we got to go. There's a Cayman right there. It was that kind of experience, you know. And I love him for that. I love that he fights for the image and all that. Sometimes, of course, the practical side of me, dare I say the producer side of me once to strangle him, uh, but uh, he's incredible, he's an artist. And for this movie, our relationship was so harmonious. 
we, I took him to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, we, which is always what we do. We just start looking and talking in all kinds of art. And we had very strange, disparate references. You know, we, the same sentence, we would talk about Zoberon, and we would also talk about Max Beckman's self-portrait. I mean, it was very weird, eclectic. And we did, well, I, I lie about one thing. We, we did look at um, a few 80s movies of no fame at all, just to look at the film stock, the way that it looked. And what we realized was that shooting it on film was not really an answer because it, the stocks now are very different. They're actually way too good. And they don't have the same grain structure. They don't respond the same way. They have a different uh, ISO rating. We had to create a sort of simulacrum of a 1980 look. And I remember also talking about that the actors would never, it was like, I told them it was like a ghost story. It was everybody in the movie was dead. And take everybody outside their key light. No actor would ever be in the key light. So, you know, the kid comes home from school and he sees his mom on the couch. The light comes from the dining room or he comes home to get hit and the light's coming from upstairs, downstairs. You know, it, so it, it, there's an elusiveness also to the image. And he really, he got that completely. And when the shooting started, we talked really only about lenses. That was about it. I don't know. When I started coming, I was probably 12 years old which would have been 1981, so it was Richard Rowe still. So that tells you <laughs> how long I've been coming here. So I'm more nervous to screen it here than I've been to show a movie maybe ever. This is my hometown, you know, and, and I know a lot of people in that audience, and um, it's strange. It's, uh, it's very moving. The film is a, a gift to me because I... I was able to express the memories in my head and I feel so lucky and now I'm showing it to New Yorkers it's a weird and beautiful feeling plus I love this festival it's my favorite festival in the world am I allowed to say that I've just insulted other festivals but it is